Well, good morning and welcome to the OSHA Center for Integrative Medicine Grand Rounds. For those of you who are new to our Grand Rounds, my name is Peter Wayne and I currently serve as OSHA's research director as well as its overall interim center director. Before starting our meeting today, I wanna to pause and to say that my heart goes out to everyone who's feeling the pain and confusion following the death of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and before them, too many other innocent people in the black community. And that these tragedies are occurring in the midst of a pandemic that's having such a disproportionate impact on communities of color makes the situation even more heartbreaking. These events have awakened me to how little I personally understand about critical issues related to race, social justice, and equality. For these and other reasons, I'm so very grateful to be connected to the diverse network of colleagues I have through the OSHA Center and to the larger Harvard Medical School community who are committed to making a difference. Borrowing from a powerful letter written by Dr. Ann Klebonski, our president of Mass General Brigham, I can wholeheartedly say that the OSHA Center pledges to help create and be part of a healthcare system that's truly equitable for everybody and recognizes that race matters in the care that we provide, in the research we conduct, and how we educate ourselves and others. So shifting gears now, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Mats Lekander, who's a friend and a colleague and who's talking to us today from another OSHA Center for Integrative Medicine that's based at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Mats is a professor, both in the Department of Clinical Neuroscience at the Karolinska Institute, and also at Stockholm University, where he serves as the director of the Stockholm Stress Center, housed within the Division of Psychoneuroimmunology. So he understands a lot of the struggles that we're all dealing with today. Mats's fascinating and innovative research is highly interdisciplinary and uniquely bridges psychology and biomedicine. His research ranges from basic clinical science to pragmatic trials, and he, is, he and his team have a knack for exploring connections others would never consider. This is reflected in the titles of some of his more than 150 publications, such as People Expressing Olfactory and Visual Cues of Sickness Are Less Light and Biological Motion During Inflammation in Humans, um, which I had the opportunity and the honor to collaborate on. Uh, the title of Matt's talk today is Studying Sickness in Humans, an Experimental Inflammation Model to Understand Feelings and Behaviors. Matt's will plan to talk for about 40 minutes, during which you're encouraged to send questions using the Zoom chat feature on the bottom of your screen that says Q&A, question and answers. Um, and during the talk, I'll collate these and towards the end, uh, select a few um, that we'll ask them to address. So on behalf of the entire virtual community, um, I enthusiastically um, welcome uh, Professor Mats Lockender. Thank you so much, Peter and everyone. Glad to be with you from this distance, but with this actually wonderful technique. So I think this is uh, the biggest meeting I have attended so far uh, through Zoom. So I hope you can both hear me and see my slides now. So I'm gonna talk then obviously about sickness um, in humans and how we can study that. And I will try to explain why I think that studying sickness and understanding sickness is both important to understand everyday behaviors and feelings, what we choose to do, and more clinical states where we will need help from other people to get healthy again. So I think this is a broad way of thinking um, when we actually can look on different kinds of disease states from this common perspective of sickness and inflammation. So I have a, a disclosure to do looking like this, otherwise nothing I think in, in, to disclose. And uh, to start with a few uh, 
line of thoughts about why we should study sickness, why this is like, why can't we just stick to quality of life or to uh, classical emotions or to something like that, fatigue, for example, why have this perspective of sickness? And when I think of this, I depart from uh, the view of the importance of having an immune defense, like a total immune defense, where behavior is actually one part. And if we think of the, the great challenge to keep healthy, we can see from different signs that infection is and has been a really major environmental threat. And there are actually signs um, that this has been the largest threat through evolution, at least from the point of view, if you look on the change in genes that are related to defense against, against pathogens. So it's a really big turnover indicating that this has been a, a real challenge. And this is of course more obvious for us these days where we have the COVID-19 threat over us because many of the perspectives that I will share with you today come really, uh, uh, they're really obviously relevant, I think, from being sick or having the threat of becoming sick. So inflammation then, which is driving the sickness uh, or central in the sickness response is uh, centrally non-communicable disorders as well, not only infection and in at least eight of ten major killers. So inflammation is there, it's not everything but it's an important part to regulate behavior and also other systems, many systems in the body. Because the threat has been so great from infection, we need to recruit behaviors to be part of this total immune defense. This means that we need to have behaviors that help us keep uh, away from infections, but also to recover more quick when we have them. So we need to handle micro threats that we cannot see but also from changing behavior when we think that we can get sick or when we feel that we are sick. And when I think of this, uh, I, these kind of behaviors, I try to broadly divide them into two classes. And one is sickness behavior or the sickness response, which is uh, classical, uh, uh, more, uh, I think, more well-studied area for some few years now developing from the studies of sick animals, but clearly developed into an important field to understand humans and not the least psychiatric disorders, actually. The other is how we avoid disease. When we have the sickness response, this is reactive. So it's, it's in response to detection of threats within the body. It's like a stress response, actually, but detection is taking place within the body. So you feel differently when you have this response. So you feel sick, uh, sick and uh, sad or fatigued or painful, etc. So this really impacts our motivational system and how we behave because we want to behave differently when we feel differently. It's transdiagnostic in the way that it happens then across different kind of diseases or actually in healthy states as well. So this is developed, it is believed to improve recovery by saving energy, etc. So the disease avoidance, then it's like the, the very effective first line of defense where we try to avoid becoming infected in the first place. So this is proactive and disgust is important as you can see from this lady here on the right side, uh, expressing disgust in the face and this can be expressed to against people and even moral transgressions, not only food and, and stuff like that. So it really drives uh, uh, avoidance also to people and actually increases uh, in-group preferences. So ethnocentrisms, ethno ethnocentrism and uh, prejudices are actually, it seems like related to this kind of innate system to keep us self healthy, but often expressed in, in really 
uh, unfair ways. And uh, having this multi morbidity or or trans diagnostic diagnostic perspective, I can't help by by sharing uh, uh, this picture from a Canadian study um, published in Lancet a couple of years ago, showing the problem of the single disease framework because so many people have more than one disease. So multimorbidity is almost the rule, at least in older ages. So I think it, it helps to look on systems that goes across diseases. Right, so the question is then how we can study sickness uh, in humans and what are the general, the typical effects on the brain and on behavior. And uh, we can, of course, study sickness from many perspectives in humans by, by asking people questions, by taking blood samples, by studying the brain, etc. Uh, what we have tried to do is bo both having these approaches but also have a model with more experimental control and that is what I will talk about today and that is a model of sickness behavior. And if you look on the sickness response like this, if this is a like a typical view what we think are going on, you see a person here that inhales bacteria and they enter the body in some way and they will then hit a receptor that will recognize parts of the bacteria on a toll-like receptor that will, on an immune cell like a macrophage, activate the macrophage, lead to production of inflammatory agents like cytokines that will act in the periphery with a lot of functions, but they will also send a message of sickness to the brain. Something is going on, this is like a warning signal that one should focus on the body and change behavior. So the behaviors that are recruited by this way are important for recovery, in the short run at least. Because the what has evolved as a protective, medicine, uh, protective mechanism really also seems to carry a risk because if left unabated, it's, it seems to be connected to fatigue, to depression, at least part of depression, like inflammation related depression and other problems. So it should be like a stress response, go on and when not needed, it, sh it should uh, shut itself down to keep healthy. And because the uh, bacteria uh, are recognized by certain molecules that are in the cell wall of bacteria like this, you can cheat and trick the immune system that you're sick by injecting only the molecule. This is called endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide, and I will call it most often LPS here. So the model then is that you skip this part with infection and you inject the molecule so that the body responds with an inflammatory activation and so that you get a sickness response, you feel sick for a couple of hours and then you can study the subjective state of the person, the brain and behavior outputs, etc. Does it work? Well, it obviously worked because, well, I, because I, I can tell you that I also injected this in myself uh, and uh, had after about one hour some creepy feelings in the body. It felt uh, a little strange, but also for me extremely interesting because I, I got sick at work under control and nice conditions. So that was not the typical sickness reaction, I think. But after an hour, something you start to feel sick. And you can see in the picture here that inflammatory markers in the blood increases. That's the red and the blue line for women and men. It's sometimes, but not always, stronger in women. But if stronger in any sex, it's stronger in women 
across studies. So we have this peripheral response, and would it reach the brain? Well, it does. This is from American colleagues showing that if you inject LPS and then you measure a marker of glial activation in the brain called TSPO with PET positron emission tomography, you can see that this is like only the MR scans and this is before injection of LPS. You have some activity in these glial cells and three hours after LPS you have almost all over the brain activation of glial cells that are mainly microglia but also astrocytes. So this is the inflammatory response in the brain that is related to behavior change. This is a tricky method. We've used it as well in some uh, disease states. And we can see uh, that in fibromyalgia, for example, we see a higher signal of this marker. And this is also seen in meta-analysis of depression. So maybe this is relevant for pain and depression, but for other disease states, we don't see activation and other people don't see activations or sometimes deactivation. So it's really a tricky system, expensive and a lot of work to do. If you look on some typical uh, subjective changes, uh, we have here uh, collapsed uh, studies in, made by us in Sweden and our colleagues in Essen in Germany. And you can see from the panel here of anxiety that after about two hours, when you had even a low dose of LPS, this is kind of low, you hardly notice it actually, uh, you have an increase in anxiety, in state anxiety. And after about six hours, it's back to normal. So you have an increase in state anxiety. I don't show it here, but for depressed mood, it's a similar picture. What I do show here is fatigue and sleepiness. And fatigue is of, poor, poor, is of course part of having the signal to rest. And the same goes for sleepiness, where you have an increased sleep drive by having the inflammatory activation. I think also sleepiness is interesting because that's often forgotten actually, that it's not the same as fatigue and it's coupled to other kinds of problems like uh, injuries and uh, uh, mind wandering and many things that actually are problematic for us, but we don't often think of them. Fatigue is naturally a really big, uh, a really important symptom as is pain, right? And when I sometimes get the question, when I study subject, but this, these kind of measures are only subjective. What do you study these things that they are only subjective? And then I try to get back with data and I show them, for example, this study. This is from the UK Biobank with half a million people. And here they had like 500 measures or something, and they just tested what are the best predictors of mortality within a five year period. So five, all cause mortality within five years. And this picture shows only men, but you can see uh, on this axis here that the most predictive measure of all collected measures was the overall health rating. That is the response to the question, how would you rate your general state of health? Better than, for example, the blue dots here that are blood related uh, measures. And there are other biomedical measures in here. So speaking to person, uh, you will obviously get data that are also really important from the objective uh, viewpoint. In, uh, viewed in, in this way. And what they focused on in the conclusion of the study was that these subjective uh, measures really matter and that self-rated health and walking speed came out as important predictors. 
now I'm going to talk about self-related health and inflammation. And later, keep that in mind on walking speed. And because we have this uh, sickness signaling, the, the sickness, uh, the, the sickness uh, message, the message of being sick sent to the brain through these inflammatory cytokines, it's natural to think that higher levels of inflammation would be related to a less good self-rated health, the general health appraisal. And that is the case. We studied that in, in many years, actually, also in, in uh, longitudinal studies in, in the US. It's not always the case, but that's the general pattern of results and not a perfect relation, but some relation there better than other biological markers that have been examined. So maybe there is something there. But could you also push this system in the short term? Could you make people change their mind? And the answer is yes. And here we use the LPS model again. So we ask people about their general health appraisal with the same question that is predictive of mortality in the big studies. Here is then ratings of very good health. And you can see that everyone who comes into a study like this, perhaps not so surprising, are actually rating their health as very good. They stay with their good health ratings if they get placebo, but if they have this inflammatory activation through LPS, they actually change their mind and they have a considerable drop down to the levels of a typical, at least in Sweden, primary care health patient that is somewhere in this round of neither good nor poor health. It returns slowly back and if you have a little, little lower dose of the inflammatory um, uh, activation molecule, injected, you have a less strong response. Here, we also asked once, and that was because if you ask repeatedly about a general appraisal of something, it might be a little suspicious. So we asked once, and we saw a similar effect, but slightly lower with a lower dose. So we seem to have an impact of what you generally think is the case when you are in a sick state. You get more dysphoric or dystopic and have a negative bias, I think we can conclude. Right, we developed a questionnaire for sickness. It's now validated in English as well. Uh, and we, if we administer this to people who get this inflammatory activation, not so surprisingly, they have like in red here, after 90 minutes, quite a big increase in this sickness uh, questionnaire rating. But what I want you to see here, the message is not that it increases, it's the big variability. Why is that so? You can see the same for back pain, spontaneous back pain and headache as well. I, I think the question is that we have no clue it's something that we start to that we start to try to investigate with different means. And I think of it now in these days when we have not only, um, as in the case of sepsis, that it's very unpredictable who will respond in a poor way, but also in the COVID-19 uh, disease state where the, you have really quick swings and changes in disease state and where the cytokine storms seem to be very hard to predict who will get and get it and when. So the, the individual difference variability is really interesting. And I think it also relates to knowledge that is more related to this not life threatening states. If you study pain, when you uh, inflict pain in some way, would this be, would the sensitivity to pain change as a consequence of, consequence of inflammatory activation? And uh, what you see in the panel here is the change in pressure pain thresholds 
after LPS and after placebo. Uh, and after placebo. Here is the change after one and a half hour after placebo. So it drops a little bit. You get slightly more sensitive, perhaps as a matter of the, the a diurnal rhythm or something. But if you have an LPS injection, you get really much more sensitive to pain, meaning that when we have a pressure uh, on a tender point, a muscle, and you press, you need to press less hard until it is also painful. So it shifts from only, only pressure to pain earlier, so you get more pressure pain sensitive. And when we started to do this, we were kind of first we thought, but at the same time, it was like so many people were doing similar things. And the good thing is that we can be quite sure that we know that you get this hyperalgesic state uh, for deep pain uh, when you have a, an inflammatory state inflicted. So this is tested with pressure pain or with visceral pain. Okay, is this related to chronic ill health in any way? And uh, we think that it is, uh, and uh, we can of course not be sure of this, but we kind of uh, notice many, many signs that it could be of relevance. And here is one such example. If you look on the brain response uh, to pain, you can compare that to the same thing when you compare patients with fibromyalgia versus controls. So in this picture here, you see that during pain provocation, you have less activation of this frontal part of the brain when you have received LPS, like an effect of the inflammatory activation. This region is, is central in control of the pain, and it's activated not only by pharmacological pain treatment, but also by factors such as distraction or hypnosis or placebo. So if you have a placebo pain uh, effect, this is also related to this area. And if you look on the patients with uh, fibromyalgia versus healthy persons, you see that they are also less activated in the same part of the brain. So maybe, the, and this is in speculation, maybe this is a state for a few hours where you get a functional change in the, in the nociceptive symptom, uh, system. So similar to what is called nociplastic pain, perhaps. If I summarize some uh, findings from us and others uh, in, uh, from the brain's point of view, so to speak, uh, we can really see that we have changes in parts of the brain that respond to bodily changes, but also that control bodily changes and emotions. So this draws on other study, our studies, but also similar studies by others, also when using uh, vaccination rather than LPS injection. So increased activation of areas involved in pain uh, and in interoception. And especially the insular cortex seems to be activated, the anterior part especially. And this part of the brain is then central in, in reading changes in bodily state and starting the interpretation of what this means. Because we think this is also very important because uh, in terms of the behavior issues, I mean, is this pain normal or is it a sign of ill health? Should you ignore it or should you be happy because you perhaps had physical exercise yesterday, or is it a sign of ill health that you should, uh, that should lead to change behavior or health checkup? So insula is activated, the same as amygdala, which gets more sensitive. 
and you see in frontal areas like the orbitofrontal cortex and the cingulate cortex generally less activation. So perhaps being more sensitive, uh, more body focused uh, is part of this, this, act, this pattern of activations and deactivations. And uh, what people have commented on several times is that when you look, if you look on the general patterns of results, you, you have uh, areas sensitive for inflammation that are quite close to the areas that are implicated in major depression. There are also similarities with changes in activity and also in structure of the brain for pain sensitivity like chronic pain. And to conclude this part of the talk, I said something about individual variability. Uh, and this could go also for not only brain function, but also brain structure. So what we are doing now, but have not published, is to look on size of these areas. And we actually see that especially size of the insula is correlated to how sick you feel and how anxious you get from the sickness response. So a bigger anterior insula is coupled to a stronger sickness, more sickness and more anxiety. Okay, so I'm gonna talk now about the proactive behaviors for a little while uh, and the attitudes to others, what we can learn from that. And here we have, as I said, discussed as a uh, core emotion because that is related to keeping away from things that could be toxic or maybe also contagious. So it's a distaste reaction and maybe it coupled them to disease avoidance. Also from the COVID-19 perspective, I just must mention that if you have people behave in the way that you really protect yourself from infection, like hand using hand cleaners or wipes and you check lymph nodes, you don't touch elevator buttons, you, you do these kind of things that people with health, high health anxiety do, you actually increase health anxiety over time in people and also disgust sensitivity. And this treatment is actually the exact opposite of what we do in when we treat health anxiety patients, because then they are then exposed to situations that will increase worry, but they can't avoid, they shouldn't avoid the situation. And that exposure leads to a big, big help in, in how much troubles you have. Okay, so we ask them, can you detect it? If you should respond to sickness in others or perhaps infection, can you detect it in other people? So we take pictures then and sample different kinds of things, even uh, uh, olfactory samples, as Peter alluded to in the introduction, when people are sick. So now we can just think, is the right one or the left one the sick one, the version? And I think you see that the right one is the sick version. It's average phases. A lot of people uh, averaged into one single phase. And this is changing then slightly when you have this inflammatory activation. When we show this picture, the original pictures to people, they, and they have to choose if the person uh, they see is sick or healthy, they are kind of good in identifying this. It's not perfect, but it's, it's kind of good. And as you may see in this picture, there are things related to the skin and to the mouth and eyes that are actually changing. And this is in line with other previous research as well. So having a more sick and tired look is of course related to, to sick or healthy. But also if you look pale, the skin, but especially actually the lips, but also the droopy corners of the mouth and uh, more uh, hanging eyelids, etc. So these are changes that seem to signal perhaps not only a, I don't know, depressed mood or sadness or fatigue or something like that, but also uh, maybe a sign of illness. So I think I skipped this. I can just say that we did 
sweaty t-shirt experiments and having people uh, we did not do the left part we did the right part with the sweaty t-shirt and have people rating these uh, smell samples when presented from flasks they smell it and they rate it and they feel that it's more intense and less healthy and uh, less pleasant when people have had this LPS response. So we did that a couple of times. This can actually be integrated so that you use both the, uh, the visual signal and the olfactory signal. So it, it's actually so that people's faces after sickness are less liked. So they seem to be less socially desirable, which would be in line with the idea of avoidance propagated from, from uh, uh, suspecting sickness in others. And we tested this uh, by also presenting a sick or healthy body odor at the same time. So we saw an interaction. So both having a sick appearance and uh, if the rater also feels the smell, even actually subconsciously, it's very weak, the signal, uh, they further dislike the persons like that. Which we examined also with neuroimaging and replicated in the subsequent behavioral study. So I'm going to talk a little bit about movement here and uh, being interested in this for a long time, we did very simple experiments from the beginning after LPS experiments, just having people walk and we videotape them. And these are short excerpts from these videos and we let other people try to determine uh, if they were sick or healthy, sad, etc. So um, the, we could see that people rated people as less, less healthy by just uh, looking at a, pic, a little video clip of people walking. But we also saw that the walking speed, getting back to walking speed, uh, was actually quite strongly correlated to how healthy a person appeared. So this is really, uh, really a, a pilot study and an amateurish way to try to get to biological movement in which we are not experts yet. But then we tried also really uh, a simple way with, uh, with a Kinect camera from Xbox to capture these changes in movement. And uh, this uh, was done because we couldn't move people when they had the sickness response, even if they are not that bad off, we cannot move them to, to a bi-motion lab. We don't have as good one in, at the Karolinska as we do, as you do in Boston, I know that. But we just tried with this simple toy, more or less that would try to extract um, objective data of movement changes. And that was the paper that Peter alluded to, and we got help from Peter, uh, who is the expert, uh, at least in our team, really the expert uh, on, on movement. So that was great, and I hope we can do more uh, in this vein uh, later on. And we actually, if I summarize those results, uh, we saw actually quite clear changes in both posture and movement pattern. And uh, one thing that I always was fascinated was, was, uh, was that how artists paint people that are sick or sad for, for that case, but without data, I, I mainly looked on artists uh, trying to, to catch this, this sickness. And they often have this slumped posture with a, with a tilted head like that. And that was significantly affected uh, when measured after LPS. We could also see that people flexed more. They had a more rigid uh, uh, walking pattern. They had less arm swing and shorter strides, and actually also slower walking. 
right? So uh, that could then possibly be cues of ill health to other people. So that's the next phase that we have started to collect data. I have not the results yet, but I will only show you two film clips when we transform the data from the Xbox uh, Kinect system to point-like displays, classical uh, ways to, to show that single patterns of movement can uh, convey messages of, of state, inner state of other people. So you look on one person here walking in a sick or a healthy state, and you see the same person walking in another state. I think it's kind of a pop out uh, effect where you actually see a big difference in, in walking pattern. This is only one person, so I'm just picking this because it gets uh, an effective way to show what I think is the effect, I don't know yet. Right, so we have the and uh, just as we know that animals can, humans seem to be able to pick up these signs of ill health also through olfactory uh, patterns. We don't know by which molecules. We have some, some candidate molecules that we examine together with the Monell lab uh, in the US. Uh, but we're not really there yet, I think. But it's, it shows that, or it confirms the data that has come out that humans are much better in terms of their olfactory ability as compared to what was previously believed. We are not as bad as we think, and often just as good actually as rats or dogs. So that's fascinating. Okay, so I want to... Uh, have a short reflection on treatment of uh, mainly uh, psychological or mental ill health, something about pain. And if we can relate these ideas about inflammation to uh, especially psychological treatment, because that's what I, what I do, or, or different kind of behavior treatments. So we could then think that there could be a relation uh, between what these cells are doing in the periphery and uh, how effective a treatment is. Because these cells that are activated in the periphery, they release these molecules that change his brain and behavior, cause, uh, try to make you uh, rest to avoid uh, punishment, to avoid pain, etc., to learn more slowly, not to move. So that would be a negative factor, I think, in most uh, uh, lifestyle-oriented uh, uh, interventions. But there is also so that we have systems that communicate back from, from the brain that uh, could, uh, through exam for example, through less stress levels or being less anxious or being in a better physical state that could actually influence the activation of these cells. We know that quite well actually uh, from, uh, from especially from animal research that the signal back is important, the stress related signal at least. Uh, actually also a disease cue signal. We have data where we have uh, had people smell on disgusting uh, odors, and we can see an activation in saliva from uh, some of these markers, and other people have done some similar ways. So there may be a, like an interaction here, right? And if we look on, on uh, the general data out there on inflammation in relation to behavioral treatment, on the left side, that's a meta-analysis where we try to, to uh, to use the data available uh, from different kinds of behavioral treatments and looking on uh, immune outcomes. And the total effect here was that there was a slight decrease uh, in inflammatory markers, and that was driven by a CRP, C-reactive protein, that diminished a little bit. So that was intriguing, we think, because these, these uh, treatments weren't even, even very effective. 
And this other perspective that low-grade information may actually uh, change how effective other treatments are, uh, we examine that in chronic pain patients. And we have done a long series of studies of acceptance-based therapies for chronic pain in adults. And uh, here in this small pilot study, we saw that higher low-grade inflammation or higher, higher inflammation, that is low-grade inflammation, at baseline was a negative um, predictor of the effect of treatment. We also see relation to, to flexibility that we think is really intriguing, and that is uh, that we haven't published, but we have more data on that in collaboration with a unit in Stanford. So that's, that's maybe there is something there, but it's not that easy. Uh, and uh, I doubt that we will see big effects of inflammation, and I'll explain why. And then I want to mention that we have at the Osher Center at Karolinska, we have uh, uh, many clinics that we work with quite closely, the pain clinic, well, two cl pain clinics at least, and not the least, this primary care unit where some of you have uh, been actually for a visit. So this is a place where a lot of, of uh, treatment to um, is developed but also implemented. So it's a center, a competence center for mental ill health. And uh, these are some of the team members uh, doing this research there. Very effective. And uh, if I point on Fredrik Santoft here, he did a huge study on inflammation and behavioral treatment. So he studied more than 350 patients before and after really effective treatment for uh, stress-related disorders, anxiety and depression to see if there was a change and if it was a moderation of treatment effect. He saw some relations to how stressed you were, but otherwise no effect of this really effective treatment. So it's you can really change symptom uh, load, but without having an effect. Uh, in terms of inflammatory markers. I also mentioned Martin Ingmar here because he used this Gustav's Berry model to build big systems to analyze data, how they can be used and how they can make care uh, more effective actually. However, if we study sickness, if we don't measure the inflammatory markers, but we go for the the subjective aspects, we have seen a couple of studies that we have reduced sickness behavior ratings, like for example, in health anxiety, a reduced rating over time here. And if we look on self-rated health, we see the same pattern where you have, or the opposite pattern that you have increased, you have better self-rated health over time after having this behavior treatment for health anxiety, severe health anxiety. This is exactly the same pattern when we, when we study stress-related disorders like exhaustion disorder, we call it that in Sweden, and uh, adjustment disorder. So the subjective sickness changes, but we can't really measure the biological correlates. But we think that having this combination of subjective measures and objective measures is one way to develop this area further. The impact of inflammation on behavioral outcome or treatment outcome is much studied in treatment of depression because higher baseline inflammation is related to not only to more severe depression, but also to treatment resistance. So maybe for pain, maybe for depression, but in like common mental disorders, we can't really treat them and have a reduction of inflammatory markers. But the subjective state, the sickness state, the healthy feeling, we can really help with that. Thank you so much for, for your attention. And I will then try to stop sharing my screen and give the word back to Peter. Well, Mats, thank you. That was um, as amazing a, a talk as I was anticipating it to be, and so rich in its 
um, mind-body connections and thinking of integrative health truly in an integrative manner. Um, so thank you. Uh, we have a, a couple of, of interesting questions here. So I'll just pose a few of them to you if you'd be willing to, to respond to them. One of them asks about the um, cultural specificities of the cues that you saw. Um, so um, you, you may be muted. I don't know if you're, you're speaking. Yeah, I, I'm not just uh, looking happy. Yeah, and um, so <laughs> obviously there's cultural and gender and other things. And then uh, the question evolved into interspecies um, as well, whether you can notice by certain cues like smells whether your pet is, is ill. Oh. oh, really great questions. And the f I love the first question with the cultural influences because we have from uh, anthropological studies so many in indications that, that uh, the way you interpret uh, both your own body and other people's body is changed by cultural uh, experiences and, and what, what you learn. I, I can't review that, I'm not good enough, but I know that there are really extreme examples where you, uh, where you interpret uh, things as being sick when it's actually a sadness or grief, etc., across culture. So maybe there is something there. I know only one study that did this and in a more specific way, and that is a person, I don't remember the first name of him, is Shatuk is his name. He used our sickness questionnaire to put that in a cultural context and showing uh, uh, quite a big impact of, of cultural factors, it seems like. So I'm quite sure, I can't review it, but I'm, 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 I, I truly believe that we shape part of this uh, with uh, kind of uh, what 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 um, what we expect and what we have learned, we have looked on expectations in relations to that. So it seems like that we have an effect of expectation. I think that is actually influenced a lot, and I think we train our brain uh, in uh, good or bad ways by the way we behave, how much we focus on the body, and how much we are in the outer world, so to speak. The other qu big question, the other question about interspecies, I'm not the real expert on that, but I certainly know that we have, well, obvious, I think, anecdotes of uh, these things, but especially good uh, data, I think, from animals detecting human illness. And uh, this goes for uh, tumors, early detection of tumors, and the uh, need for um, uh, the, the state in diabetes. So having help from dogs by, I think by smell only, well it is by smell, to help get warning signals when you act. So there are definitely factors like that in play. And I guess, the, I guess dog owners would agree that you can, I don't have a dog, but I guess dog owners could uh, see these things. I just mentioned one fun thing about this, and that is that, kind of the founding father, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, veterinarian, uh, I just forgot his name, I had a, it come back soon, uh, an American veterinarian who kind of wrote the, the uh, Benjamin Hart, he wrote the first article on sickness behavior and the first really good art article on, on uh, disease avoidance. He actually is producing video clips and books about how dogs can fake medical symptoms to get attention. <laughs> Brilliant mind lives in California. That's fascinating. Um, I'm going to ask you an, uh, a more technical question. We have a translational, um, a, a real diversity of participants. But um, one question around immune reaction was, have you looked at TLR ligands in addition to the standard inflammatory markers and, and how they might correlate with symptoms? Oh, great. Also great question. And we, we have not. And we, what our ambition is to uh, get much better in terms of the uh, immune analysis, because it has been a little bit that what we did in previous years didn't really inform us about function. So we we, we got stuck a little bit with measuring IL-6 and TNF-alpha and some other things. But now we, our ambition is to get back to have a much better uh, analysis of regulatory functions that could modulate the 
how sensitive you are to information. And I think that is, I mean, the, the, what we try to argue is that this could tell us, for example, something on, on sensitivity for, for psychiatric uh, disease, where, where one part of the problem, at least, is, can be inflammatory activation. So the great uh, variability could probably be better understood if we have better uh, analysis of the, the immune response. Fantastic. Well, I have a question based on our discussions. I mean, you talked about using cognitive um, tools to maybe enhance resilience to these um, experimental perturbations and obviously to um, more chronic uh, natural conditions. And given that you and, I, you and, and our work through sort of a model of embodied cognition have seen correlates with shape of the body and these subjective experiences, do you think that uh, having people walk in a different way, maybe upright and to stand or, you know, to hold certain yoga postures um, would change the half-life of, of your experimental perturbation um, or, you know, can, can have direct effects in these chronic illnesses? I, I, I really do, uh, but I, I don't have good data for it. I only have anecdotes and understanding that physiotherapists works with uh, getting rid of uh, uh, movement patterns that are kind of memories of things that should be avoided because when they had pain they shouldn't do a certain movement. So I understand that people work with that and I am uh, I know for sure that in pain a lot of the problems that, that we at least those that we can help with from uh, psychology is uh, related to fear and uh, over uh, like interpretations in terms of uh, catastrophic terms for example of bodily events that can be changed and that should possibly be uh, that could possibly be affected also by by how you actually decide to move or train to move but maybe you have better uh, data or ideas, Peter, than, than I do. I, I'm sure you have. Well, we're, we're just beginning to collect some data, but there does seem to be some, some data that if you change people's shape as they stand or walk, you change their, their, their mood and their behavior. And uh, You've seen some of the other work by McCulloch and, and others uh, um, supporting that as well. Um, well, we're getting close to the end, and I, I want to give you a really challenging question that, that's on, on our list. Um, given that you're studying disgust, avoidance behaviors, interpretations, and now we're all walking around wearing masks um, and worrying about who's infected and who's not infected, um, are there some things you've learned from your work that could help us normalize and, and sort of reduce the half-life of this um, psychological trauma, even after the threat of, 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 of a biological infection is gone? Yeah, I think I think in terms of looking on risks, uh, which is not directly related to this question, I think the big risk of of the the stress, the economic pressure, all these things that can actually uh, impact on not the least mental health. That's really one important aspect. But I think that what I'm worried about is prejudices and uh, the. Uh, because uh, even though we kind of guess that it's that uh, that the the attitude towards others and the in-group mentality is related to disease avoiding mechanism that is guess but it's a lot of data that points in that direction but we don't know for sure at least but we know that if people uh, are scared with in experiments with data on how dangerous it is with the flu or other things that scare them uh, in, in terms of disease threats, they actually get less, have, have less positive attitudes towards immigrants. So you can actually, but that in one experiment, it was broken by actually cleaning your hands in between. <laughs> so maybe there are positive things that, but my worry is that we will kind of um, forget that we actually are very sensitive to these kind of threats in our attitudes to other people. So I think that's an important message to keep our hearts warm in times of threat. Mm. Well, what a wonderful place to end with um, such important um, wisdom at, at this time. 
So I want to um, thank everyone for participating and just give you a couple of announcements about um, some events that are coming up in the near future. Uh, we meet monthly and our grand rounds uh, rotate between research presentations such as the one today and uh, clinical cases. Uh, so next month will be a clinical case um, led by um, uh, Anna Marie Rossenau and her colleagues at Mass General Hospital. And it's uh, entitled a novel mind-body program for promoting brain health. And she's been doing some really interesting uh, multimodal interventions for dementia and uh, prevention of dementia. And then the following month in August, we have um, um, uh, Christine Gertz from Duke University gonna be presenting non-pharmacological approaches to the management of, of chronic pain, lessons from pragmatic trials of chiropractic. I also wanna give everyone a heads up that we're moving forward with our network forum. Uh, which happens every two years. It's going to be November 6th. Um, it's going to be really exciting. It addresses a number of important issues um, around um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and how we educate the medical profession around that, as well as some interesting um, other topics around interprofessional education. Um, that's going to be November 6th, and you can register for that on our website. Um, finally, please go to our website and we have some um, very useful information that our clinicians and colleagues have been sharing um, regarding the COVID-19 situation. So uh, once again, I, I'm sure if we can hear everyone clap and, and read facial expressions, you'd see how delighted everyone in our community is, Mots, for such an excellent presentation. Um, but thank you for making time to do this and um, I wish you and your colleagues all the best during these times as well. And thanks again to everyone for participating. Thank you.